and for the general practitioner. I have a few remarks to make before I introduce your two co-chairmen. The Law Society has two great problems which, with which it is confronted. They are both reflected in the money which the Law Society is asking you to pay. One, of course, is errors and omissions. Your premium has to be up, and it's up high enough. The other is the question of professional responsibility, risk management, loss control, getting back to errors and omissions, and professional ethics, professional conduct. And the society has asked me, and indeed has directed me, to introduce into continuing legal education programming uh, as much as I can and as much as the profession wants to accept on these two areas, what the society seeks to do and what you as members of the society seek to do is to close the door not to have to bail ourselves out after the damage has been done. Now, standing in this room and speaking to you, I'm obviously speaking to the wrong people. You are here and you are not a crowd, I can say with some assurance, that is causing us all trouble. But the society has trouble in these two areas, and I have been asked to see what can be done by way of introducing these matters and the, to overcome them through continuing legal education. And you will find that our final paper today is an excellent paper on this very subject in the very area of estate planning and estate administration. Now, I know that Mr. Burley is going to have a little more to say on that. Uh, in a few moments. I apologize for the temperature in this room. Strangely enough, this room is a hard room to control, but I can assure you the maintenance people are working on that issue right now. And I invite any of you who have still have coats or jackets on to take them off if you would feel more comfortable in doing so. Now, it's my pleasant duty and very quick duty to introduce both <coughs> Mr. Burley and Mr. Schnur, our two co-chairmen. Mr. Burley hails from London, the University of Western Ontario, 1945. He did postgraduate work in business administration and worked for an industrial concern before he ever thought of law school. However, he found the error of his ways and he attended law school and at, at uh, Osgoode Hall here, called the bar in 1955 and joined the National Trust Company, worked for many years in Montreal, returned to Toronto where he was manager of the Trust and Services Department, working in wills, trusts and estate planning and tax planning. Uh, and that time, of course, tax included two uh, after death statutes which you no longer worry about, the estate tax and succession duty act. Then 1967, Mr. Burley joined the firm, the present firm of Blaney Pastor and Axmel and Watson. And he has been and is director of the estate planning section of the bar admission course. He's lectured widely, being chairman of the wills and trust section of the Canadian Bar Association and a rare honor for a Canadian is a member of the American College of Probate Council. He's a member of the Executive Council of the International Academy of Estate and Trust Law and is co-editor of the Estate and Trust Quarterly. He's a venture of the Law Society, works hard for the Law Society, um, is past president of the Multiple Sclerosis Society of Canada and on a special advisory committee of the Canadian Cancer Society just to give example of his community work. Al, are you still Vice Chairman of the Liquor License Board? Vice Chairman of the Liquor License Board of Ontario. 
Brian, Brian Schnur, also of the firm of Blaney, Pastor X, Mellon Watson, took his undergraduate work at U of T and his LLB at the University of Toronto in 1974. Somehow he weathered the bar admission course here, got called the bar in 74 and joined his present firm, which is now a partner working in estate planning and administration, trust law and estate litigation. He has worked as a group leader and lecturer in the bar admission course and is active in the Canadian Bar Association Wills and Trust section and the International Bar Association and is a contributor to the Estates and Trust Quarterly and an old hand at what he is going to do this morning uh, with his partner Al Burley and that is run this program and indeed take part in it. With that I introduce your chairman and I think Mr. Burley has something to say. Thanks very much, George, and thank you for coming out on such a nice day when I suppose we all should be on the golf course or doing other things. Um, I think it was rather uh, useful to pick this topic to lead off the CLE programs for the present year because there's a great deal going on in this particular area, a good deal of it in the particular area of negligence. And I can tell you, and as George alluded to, as chairman of the uh, Practice and Insurance Committee for the Law Society, we are finding that there are more and more cases where solicitors are being brought to task for the work they have done in connection with the drafting of wills and planning of a state. And uh, we now have it on authority of the court that's saying once a client comes in, and ask for some advice and you proceed to give him that in relation to his will and his planning, then you open yourself to potential liability. And with that in mind, it becomes then vital that you do the job properly. Now, assets are changing over the past few years and that means that wills themselves should change. People acquire more assets and of a varied nature today. Our tax laws are changing, they do from time to time, and this dictates also what we might consider doing by way of wills. For example, with the abolition of succession duties in 1978, it was thought there was no reason to create uh, a spousal trust. I can give everything to her, she in turn can pass it on to the other members of the family and there is no tax implications, <clears throat> excuse me, even considering the uh, federal uh, tax limitations on dispositions. On the other hand though, there perhaps uh, that seems so simple that there is no guarantee if no trust is created that those assets of the deceased will ever find their way down to a next generation. So we still have factors to consider even though tax laws change. Then we're finding people uh, living longer today than they did. And as a matter of fact, if any of you happen to be listening to CFRB as I was this morning at 745, they told the results of an interesting survey uh, carried out and said that the individual who kissed his wife goodbye in the morning lived an average of five years longer, was ill half the time other people did, and earned 25% more money than the average individual. Now the first thought that came to my mind was, what if you carried the exercise out a little further? How much longer would we live and how much more would we make? So I leave that to you. Anyway, that may be reported in today's paper. But we do live longer. People live longer. Therefore, they also have to plan not only if they die today, because that's only part of planning, but what happens if uh, they live to a long and successful retirement? And we're going to introduce uh, some uh, topics uh, that will concern that, especially in the area of tax work that Mr. Shepard will speak to you about. Well, we want to cover as much as we can, but bear in mind that with this concept of a half-day program, that's not always possible. And I think you'll find the material uh, fairly comprehensive. Uh, we'll try and touch on it in the time we have, and then I commend that you go ahead and uh, read what you can. Again, you'll notice from the heading we've tried to tailor 
the material really for the general practitioner, nothing highly specialized and sophisticated estate planning are we dealing with, although it may be touched upon. Now, for those of you who are really interested in, in dealing further and didn't have the opportunity to attend the 1980 special lectures of the Law Society, may I commend to you that volume because that does deal rather extensively with ch changes in estate planning and administration. Now, you'll find in your material uh, both uh, an evaluation report, which is very helpful to Mr. Collins Williams and his staff, and also, there is room for our folio if you have any questions. Now, the one thing that concerns us with the half-day program, what time we might have to answer questions that you may wish to ask. But please, if you have any, at least write them out, preferably before the coffee break, so that we can collect them at that time. And if any time permits, we'll try to go ahead and see what uh, we can do about answering your questions or perhaps uh, privately. Well, that's all I'm going to say right now. As I said, we want to try and adhere to our timetable. I'm going to call upon Mr. Schnur to introduce our first speaker. We have to keep passing back and forth our Thai microphone. Uh, just one uh, program note, ladies and gentlemen. Let me add uh, my welcome uh, to Al Brule's and uh, just point out to you that we will uh, be attempting to follow fairly strictly the timetable that we've set out in the schedule of events in which all of you have. And we quite intentionally uh, did not schedule a panel discussion or question period at the end as uh, we sometimes have in programs such as this. There have been a lot of negative comments about those, not that they weren't worthwhile, but uh, of course just by their nature you often end up dealing with questions raised by one individual which may not uh, be of interest or relevance to uh, the majority of the people. So as Al has mentioned, we are not discouraging by any means questions, and if you have questions throughout the program, please drop, drop them on our desks. Um, I don't think there's any box, so if you'll just drop them on a desk so we see them, we'll try to address them in the event that we have time at the end. If we don't have time at the end in the formal program because we are going to try to adjourn promptly at one o'clock, then please feel free to come up. We will be around uh, after the program and be happy to attempt to deal with any questions that you have. With that as uh, hopefully the end of the preamble, I'd like to get into the program itself and introduce to you the first speaker, Mike Fitzpatrick, who will be speaking about the structure of the will. Uh, Mike is a partner at the law firm of Last Johnson in Toronto, having graduated from U of T Law School back in 1969 and being called to the bar in 1971. Mike is a very active member of the Wills and Trusts section of the Canadian Bar Association and Mike is co-author with Terry Sheard and Rodney Hull of the fourth edition of Canadian Forms of Wills. We owe Mike a bit of an apology. We had promised we would try to have a mere five or six hundred copies available for any of you who are eager to spend a very modest amount for his book, but Mike, the Danish just showed up instead, so we don't have your book for coffee. In any event, um, that book is hot off the presses just the last couple of months, and obviously one of the fundamental will texts being used across Canada. Mike Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Brian. Probably the profit I would make from the Danishes would greatly exceed that which I will earn from the royalties in the book. But uh, in any event, I do have a few copies in my briefcase. Uh, and will be available after. There's a shop to the uh, left-hand door. <laughs> Al said he wants equal time. 
My topic is to speak to you about the structure of a will. And I must say that uh, sitting down to address the topic uh, gave me a great deal of concern. And uh, as I look about, uh, each of you probably has your own uh, preferences to how you structure a will if you want to look at it in terms of clauses one, two, three, four, and so on. I don't think there's any particular form uh, that is uh, the correct form. What is important is that the will you prepare is prepared with due consideration of the many factors that go into drawing a will and the consideration uh, of the uh, wishes and the legal restrictions to some extent uh, that uh, are in place on the desires that one might wish to uh, um, implement by the will that you're drawing. I have seen many forms of wills. Uh, some people prefer the um, die and derm form. Um, some prefer uh, to have a very brief dispositive provisions at the beginning in a Schedule A with uh, all of the powers. Um, I uh, prefer a cross between those two and try to blend the powers in with the form of the will itself. So I will leave it to you to decide what form suits your drafting style best. I would just like to draw to your attention, just as a reminder, the factors that you should bear in mind when preparing wills. There are certain legal requirements. I'm speaking to a large group of lawyers. We should all be familiar with the legal requirements. Testamentary capacity. The test still goes back to Banks and Goodfellow, 1870. You should just, re I've quoted from the case in my notes the points that you should be satisfied with when taking instructions from your testator. The nature of the act, the extent of the property, and the claims to which the person ought to give effect must be appreciated by the person preparing the will. And you, as solicitor, have an obligation to satisfy yourself that this testator does appreciate those points. Brian, I think later, will be talking to you about how to avoid the contested will. This is where it starts. When the testator sees you or you're called to the hospital by son or daughter or daughter-in-law, son-in-law, you have to be satisfied that if you're called as a witness to give evidence to capacity, that you can give that evidence and that you've considered these factors. In my notes, I suggest that if you have some doubt, that you should attempt to contact the person's doctor to obtain his opinion as to the capacity to make a will. And if possible, as a result of that conversation, have the doctor act as a co-witness if his advice is such that you feel that the person has capacity. I suggest that in the borderline case where you're not certain whether or not the person has capacity, but you haven't come to the conclusion that the person does not have capacity, that the testator should be given the benefit of the doubt and that you should proceed to prepare the will. If the result is that there's a contest later, at least the interested parties have their day in court, and so do the lawyers. All I point out in that respect is you as solicitors have a positive obligation to satisfy yourself as to capacity. Once you've done that, then I just remind you briefly in my notes what the legal requirements are of a will. 
the old Wills Act is now reproduced as certain sections of the Succession Law Reform Act. The old law school chestnuts is to additions, alterations, and so on, and where a person signed, and whether it was erased, and whether you could see through it. Statute attempts to deal with a number of those problems. It also provides now for holograph wills. And you may well be faced with a situation that a testator brings into you a document or phones to talk to you. This is what I've done. You have to satisfy yourself that the document is in fact, or is not, a valid document. I had a situation recently, testator prepares a document in his own handwriting. The initial words are, this is my last will, which I know has no legal effect, but my wishes are. And he then went on to dispose of his estate in his own handwriting, signed by him, no witnesses. And unfortunately, this testator died with that document. A bit difficult to decide whether this was a holograph will or not. Not so much on the basis that it was in his own handwriting and signed by him, but did he have the necessary testamentary intention? So holograph wills are nice, but and they're convenient when you get the call from the airport and the person wants to increase the legacy or delete the legacy, but be very war wary with them. And you might well be, as I was, in the position of having to decide what do we probate. This person did have the, the normal formal standard will uh, executed several years ago with legal advice and we were then put to the test. The other factor that you should consider is when you're preparing a will for the testator, and I mentioned it later in my notes and so on, that you should be aware to the greatest extent possible of the testator's assets. Where are they? How are they held? What jurisdiction are they in? The legal formalities for wills that are set out in our statute govern assets in Ontario. They, on a conflicts of law basis, can be valid to transmit movable property in other jurisdictions. However, if there are assets in other jurisdictions, you should satisfy yourself that the document you're preparing is sufficient in that jurisdiction to carry out the testator's wishes. And there are a number of ways to do that. Later in my notes, I, I address the topic to some extent of multiple wills. And that is one manner in which you can deal with it. But critical that you find out from the testator where his assets are. Situation I remember, contested will. The factor was what did the testator appreciate the extent of her assets? the extent and nature of her assets. In speaking with the solicitor, his comment was, oh no, you would never ask her what her assets were, she'd tell you to mind your own business. So that in that situation, it might, that might be the situation that Gord Hill later refers to, if the testator wants you to, to scribe something, that's one situation. If the testator wants you to perform a professional job for her, for him, it's necessary that you have the materials to enable you to perform that function. While Section 2 of the Succession Law Reform Act gives the individual the right to make a will, to transmit property on death to whomever he or she wishes, there are limitations on that freedom. Limitations such as dependent relief legislation, perpetuities <coughs> legislation, and <coughs> accumulations. 
I won't deal with these topics. Brian later deals with uh, a number of them. All I do is remind you that perhaps what the testator wishes to do cannot be done for certain reasons that the legislature's decided is a greater public interest. There are statutory restrictions on this freedom. There is also a number of legal rules that limit the carrying out of a testator's wishes. One of these that I frequently see is the rule in Saunders and Vautier. It's an old, old principle, but basically prevents the person from delaying the enjoyment of a gift to a point in time if no one else has any interest in that gift. And a recent will that I was looking at <clears throat> attempted to carry out the testator's wishes by merely changing the standard infant's clause. And I'll just read it to you. Notwithstanding anything in this my will contained, the share of any beneficiary shall be held and invested, and the net income derived therefrom shall be paid and or transferred to such beneficiary until he or she attains the age of 25 years when such benefits shall be paid or transferred to him or her. This is squarely within the principle in Saunders and Vautier. The testator wanted to hold up this gift or these beneficiaries until they were 25. There is no gift over. At 18, the beneficiary comes into the executors and says, hand me over the assets. And the executor has no choice but to do so. The executor cannot say, you have to wait until you're 25 because Joe Blow might take if you don't attain 25. So all I say is, this, this holdup could effectively have been drafted. It was not. The testator's wishes were not carried out. If there had been a mere gift over in the event the person hadn't attained the age of 25, it was to go to the issue of the person or was to fall into residue or something of that nature, would be sufficient to get you out of the rule of Sanders and Voce. So I just draw that to your attention. And, and the infant's clause that you see in standard forms of wills speak of majority or 18. It's there for that purpose. It's not a hold-up clause. It's there to enable the trustees to hold assets that otherwise would have to be paid into court. It is there as well, in many cases, to enable the trustees to pay it on behalf of the child or the benefit of the child and obtain a valid receipt from those persons named in the clauses. It's not a hold-up clause. And simply to change the age is not an effective way of accomplishing the testator's wishes. Those are some of the restrictions on preparing wills. There are a number of considerations that you must bear in mind when taking instructions. And these are factors that you have from experience or from study learned that I should be aware of these things when the testator is giving me instructions. I can assist them in thinking of alternatives or when they suggest or indicate what their wishes are that I can point out to them that it's possible or it can be done in this way or in, in another way. When I'm taking instructions, I basically want to find out about the testator's family, ages, birth dates, marital status, and so on. I then want to find out what assets the person has, details of those assets. And then I ask what the person would like to do with all these assets. After the person tells me that, and we've decided how that might be done, I then can decide what executive 
or executors and trustees' powers should be put in the document, and who should be the executors and trustees to carry out these wishes. I think the way I prepare them, the executors and trustees are the last choice because the person may have a preconceived idea that it should be so-and-so, but when you can consider the various alternatives, that might not be the appropriate choice. Considerations or factors that I've set out in my notes to bear in mind when you're taking instructions to prepare a will include particulars relating to specific bequests or devises. It's important that you properly describe a specific gift to a person. You, I later talk about lapse, redemption, and so on. But it, initially, the description of the articles is, it must be clear. Real property is not, in my experience, as great a problem as personal property. Real property can be described in great detail or with su sufficient description to be able to identify uh, the property. <clears throat> a recent uh, example I was looking at was uh, a, a draft of a will that contained uh, my property near uh, Ashton, Ontario. And um, I thought, well, that's pretty general. Uh, how much property does the person have near Ashton, Ontario? Fortunately, Ashton, Ontario is a very small little town. Uh, if it had been near Toronto, uh, that might have been a bit, you know, the search might have been a, a, a bit more difficult. Greater difficulty, however, is encountered with the description of personality. My diamond ring, my gold tie bar, a gold tie bar, and as you recall, the word my or a has some significance in preparing the will. Is it intended when the person says my diamond ring that it's the diamond ring they own at the time they make the will or is it whatever diamond ring they happen to own at the time of death? And the person may have two or three diamond rings. Obtain sufficient particulars of the asset and I put it to the clients, look it, if you or your husband are around, that's fine, or your daughters. If some strange executor goes in with a list of assets, set out in a will, and look into your jewelry drawer or your safety deposit box, they have to be able to identify the assets set out in your will. You know what they are, your husband may know what they are, but the stranger may not. So give me sufficient detail to enable me to carry out what you want to do. A change I would point out to you uh, on Succession Law Reform Act is when you make a gift of a specific asset, the most common example being a piece of real property with a mortgage on it, that the Succession Law Reform Act in Section 32 now has, by statute, a role to deal with that situation. The, primarily, the liability to satisfy the mortgage, in my example, flows with the gift, unless the testator specifically indicates that that is not to be the case. So, when getting your list of assets, and there's a wish that the cottage property is to go to so -and my son so-and-so, and there happens to be a mortgage on it, you have to get instructions, or you should get instructions, to determine whether or not it's intended that the mortgage encumbrance continue, or whether it should be discharged as a general debt of the estate. And I might say it's not sufficient to rely on the general debts clause to show a contrary intention uh, with respect to that principle. I make some comments about life insurance. You should be aware of the details of life insurance on the uh, proposed testator, who the named beneficiaries are, uh, what 
the benefits are if you're getting into estate planning, uh, is that insurance likely to be there when it's needed? Uh, is it group that will disappear when the person leaves his job? Is it accidental that the person thinks he's got a half a million dollars but is not there to look after his wife and so on? Get the details of the insurance. Most testators, and myself included, have to go back to my policies from time to time to find out what I did. So it's not uh, a strange trait not to remember these details. Get them. Situation I had, person wants to draw a will, leave everything to his spouse. Gift over to the children in the event the spouse predeceased. All the insurance policies were made payable to his estate. His existing will had been a life interest will, um, as a lot of wills had been in Ontario. He said, well, if your desire is to leave everything to your wife, why not change the designations on your policies and name her the beneficiary? The result being that the insurance proceeds passed outside of the will, avoided probate fees, and were available immediately with the same result that the will would have had, but at some saving. There are, other, there are other factors to bear in mind before changing those, those designations, but in the situation I was facing, it, it uh, uh, more than paid for the cost of the will in, in uh, say, probate fees. If there are debts owing to the deceased by members of his family, uh, perhaps under uh, an income split uh, situation, you may want to obtain instructions from the testator as to whether these debts are to be forgiven or whether they are to be collected on death. Uh, you should obtain instructions. Often, uh, in a number of situations I've had, the, uh, if the amounts of the debts amongst the children were unequal, uh, the um, parent was looking for a balancing factor or something of that nature uh, to deal with those debts. You discussing with the testator, find out who he wants to benefit. You pretty well have to rely on the testator on his description of named individuals. Although you can describe the intended beneficiary by way of relationship. My brother's children. It is often left to you as solicitors, however, if there are charitable gifts, to search out the proper names of the charities. And uh, that is fairly easy to obtain, is a fairly common situation that ends up in weekly court. Uh, who is the intended charity? The Ontario Cancer Society is an organization which does not exist. There is an, a, a, an incorporated body called Canadian Cancer Society that has an Ontario division. Who does the testator or the executor pay the gift to when it says Ontario Cancer Society? Had the solicitor done a bit of homework, you wouldn't be in weekly court. There wouldn't be fees of $4,000 or $5,000 on an application for interpretation. Many charities have names that we all think are familiar to us. Uh, the Cancer Fund, uh, the uh, Heart Fund. Those require some investigation on your part. There are a number of organizations, for instance, that look after cancer needs in Ontario. A person wants to leave money and they, they think that the cancer fund is one thing. I just ask you, if the testator wants to leave charitable gifts, satisfy yourself that the name that you put in the will is the proper name. And often in phoning the offices, you find out that the people on the switchboard have to refer you about five calls to get to the person who really knows the proper legal name of the entity for whom they work. 
Another area that I would draw to your attention is class gifts. The most common, I want to divide my assets among my children. It's important to obtain instructions. When is that division to take place? At what time? And when you're dealing with a class gift and you've prepared a draft, always ask yourself the question, when is this to happen? Is it to happen on the death of the testator, the death of the survivor of the testator and his wife? Is it to happen when a particular individual attains a certain age? Time of division is one thing you have to bear in mind. The other is, when is the distribution to take place? The time of the division can be one point. The time of distribution can be another. Read your draft. Make sure that you can read this. Know when the division is taking place and when these assets are going to flow out. When people have to be alive to take. Other legal rules you have to be concerned about are lapse and anti-lapse provisions or uh, statutory anti-lapse provisions. If you leave a gift to someone who predeceases a testator, if the will is, says nothing more, that gift falls into residue if it's a specific gift if that person predeceases the testator, with very few exceptions, the exceptions being those set out in Section 31 of the Succession Law Reform Act to save gifts which were left to children, grandchildren, brothers or sisters of the testator. Ask the testator the question, what do you want to happen to this gift if the person predeceases you? Do you want it to go on to their children, brother or sister, whatever? Or is the sole beneficiary that person, no one else? Obtain the instructions and make it clear in the will that that is to be the case. Don't rely on the anti-lapse provisions of the statute. Um, and I'd suggest that you merely add in the words, uh, uh, if the person survives uh, the testator. Redemption is another principle that you should bear in mind. That is, where is the specific gift that is referred to in the will? If it's not there, the benefit is, the intended benefit is not carried out. There is a statutory modification of that principle. Section 20 of Succession Law Reform Act provides for some relief from that position in the case of sale with a mortgage back of a an asset which has been specifically devised, or if an asset has been destroyed, there's a provision dealing with insurance proceeds resulting from those assets, or in a situation where the asset has been expropriated. And that situation I recently saw with a, a specific devise of a piece of property uh, and a gift of personality as well. Uh, and it came right within the section and uh, we are looking to the insurance proceeds uh, standing in place of the uh, specific gifts. Abatement. Abatement relates to general legacies. If the testator wants to make sure that any individual receives their legacy in full, you have to show in the clause that the testator contemplated that he may not have sufficient assets to pay all of the, the legacies and that it's intended that this particular gift has priority and it's intended to be paid in full. Drafting your clause, make sure those elements are uh, obvious. As Al mentioned earlier, trust wills were very common with succession duties uh, for obvious reasons. I've now found that 
trust wills can be of great benefit in a situation, but now they can be used in situations where it's to meet a concern that the testator has, not to accomplish a particular tax saving, which might have been not really what the testator wanted to do, but it was good for tax purposes. Trust wills now can be used to assist testators to carry out their wishes much more close to the, to the point. One might want to ensure that capital passes to their children, that their spouse be cared for. They can do that by a trust will. If they left the assets outright to a spouse, the spouse might well leave them to someone else. There is no control. Some people feel very strongly that their children uh, should receive uh, what mom or dad has worked for, but they have, feel some obligation to the spouse. Other situations where you want to protect the assets uh, for the benefit of the children. But all I'm saying is trust wills now are a, a, an alternative to the outright distribution and can be used to accomplish uh, the wishes of the testator much more closely. If you have a trust will situation, or if you have a, a will where there's a hold up for individuals, I would suggest that in almost every case that you give the trustees power to use capital from that fund or from the residue for the benefit of the person for whom the funds are being held. To rely on the flow of income as the sole source of benefit for this individual in the economic climate that we see uh, is, I would suggest, a little imprudent. There are situations where the testator feels very strongly that there is no way that person should ever receive capital. All I say is point out to the testator that here, if it's going to be a hold-up situation or a life interest, draw to his attention the result of no encroachment and then obtain his instructions on that point. The person wants to leave gifts on certain conditions. It can be done. All I say is that in drafting the condition, make sure that the condition is clear. A lot of conditions are not end up in court on applications uh, for interpretation with the argument that the condition is uncertain, uh, with the result then that the gift is either made absolute or is, it fails in total depending whether one can ever decide whether it's a precedent or a subsequent condition. As I mentioned, the selection of trustees is something I leave to the end after I've discussed with the testator what he or she wishes to do. Then look to those people available to assist in carrying out those wishes. If I have a life interest situation, I like to see the spouse involved along with someone else from the point that they know what's happening. They're involved, they have to take part. The situations that uh, I look at, first, should the beneficiaries be the executors, say if they are appropriate, while in certain situations it might put them in an awkward position, look to them first as the potential field of executors and trustees. There are a number of situations where they could act along with trust companies, or trust companies could be named alone. And in my notes, I point out the number of situations where the appointment of a trust company might be the appropriate uh, appointment. Trust companies are in the business of providing uh, that service. They have an expertise in the field for which you pay 
no more than you pay to any individual, although family members may waive the compensation. And perhaps the courts might view the obligation of a trust company executor uh, with a greater de degree of skill and care required than the individual, although there should be no reason for that. I, Al referred earlier to the 1980 special lectures in this area. There are a number of lectures dealing with trustees' discretion. If you are faced with that situation, I'd recommend them to you. There are two types of discretion that uh, are mainly of concern. One is dealing with the administration of the estate, what powers, how to exercise powers, and so on. The other is uh, what I might refer to as dispositive discretions that one gives to the trustees. These, I think, are uh, less frequently used but are certainly available. And I just refer you to the lengthy uh, lectures given by uh, at least three parties in the 1980 lectures on those points if you're particularly into the situation where you want to give the trustee uh, dispositive powers or uh, deciding what time, for instance, the uh, time of distribution is to occur, uh, that type of uh, clause. I point out in my notes that uh, the use of the terms uh, absolute, unfettered, and so on um, uh, suggested add nothing to the power. Uh, if one has a discretion and you have uh, clearly in uh, the grant of the discretion to the trustee uh, made it obvious that it is absolute, uh, the adjective adds nothing to that power. I list various administrative provisions uh, in my notes. I just suggest to you that uh, I would err on the side of generosity in including uh, administrative powers uh, as opposed to uh, being sparse on um, typing. In my notes, I go through a number of factors that you should keep in mind the checklist of what should I be thinking of when I'm taking the instructions. A number of the points I previously mentioned. I leave it to you to read those notes. Read those. Bear in mind that when you're taking the instructions, try to visualize what this clause is going to look like that the person wants you to draft. If you're having difficulty saying, how am I going to do this, obtain as many instructions on the point as you can. At a point in time, one of the points I mentioned is deaths do not occur in the order that one might always expect. How far do you go in obtaining instructions as to contingencies? And I find myself sitting with people saying, well, I know there are 18 grandchildren. What happens if there are no issue left in the class? What do I do with the situation where there are two children, none of them are yet married? Uh, do I get instructions as to what happens if no one is there? And I find myself at times uh, straining the uh, situation to uh, attempt to obtain instructions with the old example that both you and your husband are in an automobile accident and are in a coma and can't get around to changing the will in that circumstance. You have to satisfy yourself, how far should I go? Look for the potential number of beneficiaries down the line. If there are few, satisfy yourself that you think you've gone far enough. If the class appears to be broad, I'd say if something disastrous happens to the class, let's worry about the coma if it happens. Just a brief note on multiple wills, and uh, I'm indebted to Al Brule, who, whose <coughs> lecture I 
lecture, his, his article I refer to in my notes to be of assistance to you. People are more mobile. They have assets in many more jurisdictions than they had 20 years ago. The Florida condominium, the European villa, the property in Arizona. You have to be satisfied when taking instructions that this person thinks he's made his will. This is what he wants to do. These are the people he wants to benefit. Point out to the person that, here, I practice law in Ontario. I think this might be valid there. I don't know if it's valid there. We'd better find out. What Mr. Brule suggests is, while it might be a bit more expensive, at least the testator, when performing this very important privilege and right, making his will to pass on his assets to the next generation or to whomever he wishes, in fact, has the advice that that is, in fact, effective. Al suggests that you take instructions, that you prepare a separate will with respect to assets in other jurisdictions, that you retain counsel in the other jurisdiction to advise whether or not that document is valid to carry out the testator's wishes. What rules are there in that jurisdiction? Statutory rules that, that may not exist here, that would prohibit his testamentary freedom. With that advice, <coughs> that document is executed. The testator has then, can then be satisfied that his present wishes are effective wherever his assets presently exist. Al points out that when you have done that, it's very important that in drafting subsequent wills, codicils and so on, that you bear in mind that this testator has more than one testamentary document, that you're very careful in your revocation clauses. Most of us have thought of one will, let's get rid of everything, revoke it, and so on. It may well be the document that was created for the Florida property is still very valid, but he wants to change his will with respect to everything else. Watch it when you draft your revocation clause. The other, that, that is probably the preferred method to deal with assets out of the jurisdiction. The will can as well. Uh, the one document can deal with the assets specifically. However, I think you should satisfy yourself by advice from counsel in the other jurisdiction that the dispositive provision in the one document is valid, that the requirements, formal requirements of a will in that jurisdiction are the same as they are here. Two witnesses or a holograph will. Some jurisdictions might require three witnesses. Previously in Ontario, uh, holograph wills weren't valid. I hope that I've pointed out some of the factors that you should bear in mind in taking instructions. It seems that uh, the, if you are aware of these factors in taking instructions, I would suggest that the testator's wishes will be adequately given effect to and that you will serve, have served your client well. Thank you for your attention. I have two very quick announcements. A set of keys has been found. They were left on the registration desk. The person who lost them, I'm sure, will want them back. Two, the upstairs classroom is open. The monitors are functioning. Uh, there are a few people, very few up there, but at the time of coffee break, if any of you think you'd like to sit up there, some people do, uh, you're welcome to do so. Thanks, George. Please don't half of you walk out now and leave upstairs. I'll 
I'll be very much uh, affected by your doing so. My feelings will be hurt. Ladies and gentlemen, the, uh, the Law Society is, is quite strict in its rules that uh, speakers can only be introduced once, uh, hence I will not be further introduced to you and just uh, move into my lecture in the materials. And the topic that I am dealing with is special will drafting problems. And what I intend to do is to expand upon uh, a number of the areas that I've covered in the paper. Um, a number of them I won't deal with because I've had an opportunity in the paper to thoroughly deal with them. And to raise with you um, a few